Hiya and welcome to Serena Speaks and before I continue with this video I just want to make you aware that in the little description box below of most of my latest videos I've actually included the time frames that I go over particular areas so just to make it easy for you to navigate through the video um, just to make you aware in case you hadn't seen that already um, but moving on let's go on to chapter 6 of the BNF which is the endocrine system now, this is a very content heavy section, but it's probably one of the more easier ones to get your head around purely because you probably dispense the medications that are in this topic more than you do in any other topic. I know when I was a pre-reg, I dispensed metformin, so many metformins on a daily basis. I don't think a day went by where we didn't dispense metformin. And I think when you're familiar with your medication, it actually makes it a lot easier to understand it. So let's start off with diabetes. I'm sure at university you've covered it extensively, but let's just have a brief recap. So the main two that you need to know is type one and type two. So one is due to a lack of insulin and the other is due to a decreased secretion of insulin or developing resistance to its actions or sometimes both. So with type one, it's an autoimmune destruction of the pancreatic beta cells and it's insulin dependent. So a patient needs to be taking insulin. Whereas with type 2, it's insulin independent. And with type 1 diabetes, you tend to see it, or it's, it develops usually in childhood. Whereas with type 2 diabetes, you tend to see it in patients later on in life. Now with diabetics, it's very important to identify their average plasma glucose concentration over a certain period of time. And typically you look at that through their HbA1c level and it should be between 48 to 59 millimoles per mole. And that's a really important range for you to remember because they like to ask it in exams. If you look at older exam papers though, they tend to have that value as a percentage. But from my understanding, now they want you to know it in millimoles per mole. Um, it's also important to remember your ranges. So um, typically your blood sugar level should be between four to nine millimoles per litre. Before food, it should be four to seven. And after food, it should be less than nine. And just some general signs and symptoms of diabetes. So polyuria, polydipsia, you're more inclined to get UTIs. And in type two diabetes, you can also experience weight loss. Now, in terms of insulin, um, you, it's, sub it's given subcutaneously and you can give it on the abdomen, the buttocks, the upper arm. Um, and it's important to rotate the sites um, of administration to prevent lipodystrophy. Now, depending on your situation, a person's insulin requirements may increase or decrease. So in the cases of trauma, infection, stress, their insulin requirements typically increase. Whereas in cases where patients may develop another endocrine um, disorder, such as Addison's disease, um, where they may develop celiac disease or they have renal or hepatic impairment, their insulin requirements tend to decrease. Now, in terms of pregnancy, um, doses usually increase in the second or third trimester. And it's important to identify whether that patient was pre-diabetic or if they develop gestational diabetes. So pre-diabetic is when they have diabetes and they get pregnant. Gestational diabetes is when they get diabetes whilst they're pregnant. So in either case, if it is type two diabetes, you would give metformin. And then in the second or third trimester, you would then give them glibenclamide. Whereas if it was type one diabetes, um, so usually in the case where it's pre-diabetes, um, you would want to give them insulin aspart or um, insulin lispro because these are the safer ones to give. And a continuous infusion can be given where multiple injection sites is impractical. So in terms of surgery, you want to give a person their normal insulin the night before. Then you may give their insulin with normal saline, 5% glucose and potassium chloride, so given all together. And then you want to reintroduce their normal insulin once they start eating again. And one of the main side effects of insulin in general is hypokalemia. So there are many different types of insulins. We have our soluble, our rapid acting, intermediate, um, long acting, biphasic. So let's dwell into each one a little bit more. So our short acting are, for example, our soluble insulins. So S for short, S for soluble. 
And our soluble insulins should typically be given 15 to 30 minutes before food. They are used in um, cases of diabetic emergencies, for example, ketoacidosis, which we'll talk more about in a moment, and they can be given IV, IM and subcutaneously. And given subcutaneously, they act in around 30 to 60 minutes time and they usually have a duration of eight hours. Then we have our rapid acting and our rapid acting are what they say, they're rapid. So they have a fast onset, but a short duration of action. And our examples are our Novo Rapid, um, so that's easy to remember, it's in the name, Novo Rapid, which is our insulin aspart. We have our Humalog, our insulin Lispro, and we have our Pedra, which is our insulin glulosine. And it's really important to remember the brand names and the generic names. I know on prescriptions, they tend to just write the brand names, but learn both. Um, and then we have our intermediate and our long acting. So example of our intermediate is isophane. So I for intermediate, I for isophane. And the brand for that is Humulin I. So make it nice and easy for us to remember. And in both cases, onset of action is usually one to two hours. Um, they can also be um, used once or twice a day with a short acting insulin. Um, with the long acting though, they're not recommended to be taken with soluble insulin. And examples of our long acting are, for example, insulin Detamir, which brand is Levamir, or our insulin Glargine, brand is Lantis. So long acting, Levamir and Lantis. So again, all L's make it easier to remember. And it's long acting, so it has a slower onset of action. And then we have our biphasic, and our biphasic contain a short and a long acting. And examples are Novamix, Humalog 25, Humalog 50, Humulin M3. So our anti-diabetic drugs, they're usually given for patients with type 2 diabetes, and they're for fa patients who have failed to respond adequately to at least three months of re reduction in carbohydrate intake and an increase in physical activity. Now, if a patient does need insulin as well, then it's recommended that it's taken at night time, either in the form of isophane, so our intermediate, or a long acting insulin. So now let's go into each class of um, anti-diabetic medication and talk a bit more about it. So first and foremost, our big one eyes, which is our metformin. Now metformin will always, always, always be first line, unless it's contraindicated in a person or it's not tolerated. Otherwise, it's always first line. And it works by decreasing gluconeogenesis. And it doesn't promote weight gain, which is why it can be used in patients who are overweight. Now, the main side effect associated with metformin tends to be GI related. So it's important that the person takes this medication with or after food. It can also um, promote lactic acidosis in patients with renal impairment. And that's actually really important because I think I have seen that question a few times in papers. So lactic acidosis can occur with metformin in patients who are renally impaired. Then we have our sulfonylureas. Now our sulfonylureas are usually given to patients where they are either contraindicated to metformin or they've not tolerated metformin. And you can get long acting and short acting sulfonylureas. Now our long acting example is our glibenchamide, um, which we mentioned in patients who are pregnant, but long acting sulfonylureas aren't recommended in elderly patients because it can um, promote hypoglycemic episodes and also confusion. Examples of our short acting are, for example, glycoside and tolbutamide. Um, these can, these sulfonylureas can cause weight gain um, and also um, are more inclined to causing hypoglycemic episodes. So we also have um, alpha glucosidase inhibitors, and an example of that is arcabose. So A for alpha, A for arcabose, and the main side effect associated with that is flatulence. You also have your meg meglitinide slash prandial glucose regulators, and examples of that is ritaglinide and ripaglinide, sorry, and nataglinide. So both of these have a fast onset of action and a short duration of action. However, with nataglinide, it's only licensed with metformin, so it can't be given on its own, only with metformin, and it's usually given 30 minutes before food. 
So we also have pyoglitazone. So pyoglitazone, it can be given alone or it can also be given with metformin or sulfonylurea. And there is a risk of developing, um, well, there is a risk of heart failure with pyoglitazone. So you need to monitor the patient. There's also a risk of bladder cancer and hepatotoxicity. So it's important for a patient to monitor or to report any um, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, um, dark urine um, or fatigue. Then we have our DPP-4 inhibitors, or as I like to call them, our liptins. So citagliptin, saxagliptin, um, linagliptin. And with these ones, it's important for a patient to report any signs of pancreatitis. So for example, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain. We also have our GLP-1 agonists, for example, exenatide, lyroglutide. With exenatide in particular, it's important that it's taken um, within one hour before food and given six hours apart, and it should never be taken after food. And again, um, exenatide can cause severe pancreatitis, so a patient needs to watch out for any signs and symptoms and report them. And then and we have our SGLT2 inhibitors, so our canagliflozin and our dapagliflozin. Who knows if I've said that right? But our dapagliflozin, that one in particular, can't be given with pyoglitazone. And the main side effects associated with it are constipation and thirst. And a patient needs to report any signs of hypertension, hypotension, postural hypotension um, or dizziness um, with canagliflozone and dapagliflozone. Dip dapagliflozin, however you say it. Um, now, with some certain medication, for example, exenatide, pyoglitazone, citagliptin and vildagliptin, a patient's treatment should only be continued on these if their HbA1c concentration is reduced by 0.5% um, within six months of starting treatment. So if that hasn't been reduced by that amount after six months, then it's maybe worth looking at um, a different alternative for them. So as we mentioned before, metformin is, to, is the first line treatment and only in the cases where it's not tolerated or it's contraindicated do we give an alternative. But if the patient can take metformin, then they're first given metformin once a day for one week, then they're given it twice a day for the second week. And then from then onwards, on the third week, they'll take it three times a day and then they'll be monitored onwards. So now if it's not tolerated, they could be given a DPP-4 inhibitor, such as so our liptins, or pyoglitazone, or a sulfonylurea. Now, if a patient isn't finding um, relief from just taking the one medicine, it might be given in a combination instead. So they might be taking um, a metformin plus a sulfonylurea, or a DPP-4 inhibitor plus sulfonylurea, or pyoglitazone plus sulfonylurea. Now, again, if a patient isn't having any benefit from just taking two medicines, they might then need to be given three medicines. So metformin plus a DPP-4 inhibitor plus sulfonylurea, or uh, metformin plus pyoglitazone plus a sulfonylurea. And in patients who are obese, pyoglitazone tends to be preferred over sulfonylurea, because as we mentioned, sulfonylurea is can um, promote weight gain and they're not recommended in overweight patients. So when I was doing this chapter and I was learning this chapter, I would get very confused between diabetic ketoacidosis, hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia, particularly the signs and symptoms of each, um, and just in general, the differences between them. And exam questions do like to compare um, the signs and symptoms and the different medications that, and treatments that are for each of the three um, conditions. So let's compare them. So diabetic ketoacidosis is due to a high blood sugar level, but a total lack of insulin. So our aim for a person who has diabetic ketoacidosis is to try and replace that fluid and electrolytes and to administer insulin, because of course, if, they're, if, it's, called, if it's caused by a lack of insulin, you need to give them insulin. So typically it's soluble insulin that would be given, um, they might also be administered sodium chloride, potassium chloride, and even a long-acting insulin. And the main signs and symptoms that are seen are nausea, vomiting, drowsiness, and something known as pear drop or fruit breath. And it's re this really smelly breath, um, and it's a very pungent smell, um, and that's typically seen with a person who 
is who has diabetic ketoacidosis. So then we have hypoglycemia, and hypoglycemia is due to low blood glucose concentration. So um, to think of the signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia, think about when you're hungry. So when you're hungry, you become irritable, you become agitated. But in terms of diabetics, it's one step further. So they can also become confused. They can be sweating. Um, they might lose colour in their face. And pharmacists that I've spoken to have said that when a person presents to them with hypoglycemia, they tend to be mistaken for someone who is drunk due to the confusion and the sweating. So that's something to be aware of. Now, if a person has hypoglycemia, you want to give them 10 to 20 grams of glucose, so in the form of Lucozade or Coca-Cola, so a sugar-filled drink. Um, you could also give them, instead of that, you could give two to four spoonfuls of sugar, or you could give them three to six sugar lumps. Um, after that, you then want to give them something a bit more substantial, so a sandwich or a biscuit. Now, that's if a person is conscious. What about if they're unconscious? So if they're unconscious, you would give them a glucagon injection. And if they don't respond after 10 minutes, then they probably need glucose IV. And then we have hyperglycemia. So hyperglycemia is due to a high blood glucose concentration. And a person usually experiences frequent urination, increased thirst, blurry vision. And if a person does have hyperglycemia, then they might need to alter their diet, drink only sugar-free drinks, and their dose, just their insulin dose um, might need to be adjusted. So there's an oral glucose tolerance test that can be which is mainly carried out for patients who might have an impairment to glucose tolerance. And the way that this is carried out is a patient will fast and then they will take 75 grams of anhydrous glucose and their blood glucose concentration will then be measured. Moving on to diabetic nephropathy and neuropathy. Now, diabetic nephropathy in layman's terms is when a diabetic patient um, progressively develops kidney disease. Now, it's very important then that for diabetic patients that we measure their serum creatinine and their urinary protein. And if they get three positive tests, um, then either an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin 2 um, inhibitor will be given to the patient and that will help protect their kidneys. So be very careful in an exam when they show you a diabetic patient. They might be under 55 years old. They might be taking metformin, glycoside, ramipril. Don't assume that, oh right, they're under 55. I know that with blood pressure, if you're under 55, an ACE inhibitor is usually um, first line given. So that ramipril must be there because of their blood pressure, because they have hypertension. Yeah, they might have hypertension, but that's not necessarily, with a diabetic, diabetic patient, that's not necessarily um, the indication in this case that ramipril is for hypertension it might be for diabetic nephropathy so just watch out for that and then diabetic neuropathy so neuropathy pain what do we give for pain paracetamol NSAID typically amitriptyline unlicensed can be given duloxetine can also be given so there's many different options for patients that have diabetic neuropathy so that was diabetes now let's move on to thyroid so thyroid you can get hypothyroidism and you can get hyperthyroidism. Now in questions they like you to know um, your different thyroid hormones, particularly your thyroid stimulating hormone, your TSH and your T4 and what that indicates and um, what a high TSH and a low TSH indicates. So if a person has a low T4 but a high TSH that indicates hypothyroidism. And if they have a high T4 and a low TSH, that indicates hyperthyroidism. Now, our hypothyroidism, we need to give thyroid hormones. So, or we need to give thyroid, um, thyroid drugs. So we have our levothyroxine and our lyothyronine. Now, our levothyroxine is our first line. Lyothyronine is usually um, reserved for patients that are either that have a hyperglycemic coma or they have severe hyperglycemic states. And it's good to use in these conditions because they have a rapid, a more rapid effect and a more rapid metabolism compared to levothyroxine. 
Now, in terms of pregnancy, um, levothyroxine does cross the placenta, but in the second and third trimester, um, they usually need a higher dose of levothyroxine. Now, if doses are too high or too low, this can have an effect on the fetus, so it is important to measure and monitor. So with hyperthyroidism, um, we have our first line, which is carbimazole, and if that's not tolerated or it's contraindicated, then a patient will be given propiothiouracil. We can tell I like saying that one. Um, now, talking more about um, carbimazole, Carbimazole can cause bone marrow suppression, it can cause neutropenia, so we need to be looking out and the patient needs to report any signs of bruising, bleeding, sore throat, fever. Now in exam questions they like to catch you out and they might say patient A comes in, they've developed nausea whilst taking their carbimazole, what should they do? Now nausea doesn't really indicate bone marrow suppression, so actually if they develop nausea it's safe for them to carry on taking that carbimazole. It's when they develop the sore throat, um, the bruising, the unexplained bruising, bleeding, um, fever, etc. That's when they need to be referred onwards. Um, now, over treatment with antithyroid drugs, um, so with your carbimazole, with your propiothyouracil, um, it can cause rapid development of hypothyroidism. So you're taking all these drugs for hyperthyroidism and then you end up getting hypothyroidism, which we want to try and avoid. And for patients that do develop this, they then need to be started on a regime called a uh, blocking replacement regimen. And that usually lasts for 18 months, but that's not suitable in pregnancy. And a person, if a person is pregnant and they have hyperthyroidism, then actually for the first trimester, they should be started on propiothyroidism. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. And for the second and third trimester, well, in the second trimester, then they'll be started on carbimazole instead. And again, with um, questions, they like you to know in which situations you would need to increase and decrease the dose. So, for example, if a patient presents um, palpitations and they tell you that they're on levothyroxine, then they would need to decrease their dose. If a patient is on carbimazole and they develop weight gain, then again, their dose would need to be decreased. A person might also de develop something called a thyrotoxic crisis, or otherwise known as a thyroid storm. So in this situation, a person would need to be given emergency IV fluids. They might also be given propanolol, hydrocortisone, and even oral iodine plus carbamazole or propyl thyroidism. So briefly talking about corticosteroids now. So with corticosteroids, the body actually produces natural corticosteroids. For example, aldosterone, which is a mineral corticoid, or, um, and also produces cortisol, which is a glucocorticoid. Now in replacement therapy, some patients um, might need replacement therapy. For example, if they have Addison's disease or they've undergone an adrenalectomy. Now with glucocorticoids, Generally, um, you want a low mineral corticoid um, activity with a high glucocorticoid activity for an effect. So example of our glucocorticoids are, for example, um, dexamethasone, betamethasone, prednisolone, prednisone. Examples of our mineral corticoids are, for example, fludrocortisone. Now, there are many instances where a patient might need um, a corticosteroid, for example, in arthritis, a rheumatoid arthritis, in asthma, and actually um, a local application is preferred over systemic. For example, it can come as creams, it can come as eye ointments, it can come as inhalation, um, and even as enemas. So some of the cautions and contraindications with corticosteroids are, for example, in those that have adrenal suppression, in those that have an infection, um, because they'll be immune, immunosuppressed. And if a person has been taking a corticosteroid for more than three weeks, then they would need to be withdrawn from it very slowly. This is with systemic corticosteroids, that is. They would need to be withdrawn gradually. Um, 
if a person is on corticosteroids long term, then they would need to carry around with them a steroid card. And it's worth mentioning that corticosteroids have been linked to um, psychiatric reactions. So, for example, insomnia, um, even a severe suicidal thoughts, um, nightmares, irritability. So that's something to be aware of. And in terms of pregnancy, you need to measure the benefit to risk ratio with giving a pregnant person a corticosteroid. Now, with glucocorticoids, the main side effects usually seen again if a person's long term on corticosteroids are, for example, um, diabetes and osteoporosis. With mineral corticoids, they're minerals, so their side effects are mineral related, as it were. So potassium and calcium loss, water and sodium retention and even hypertension. And some general um, side effects of corticosteroids are, for example, Cushing syndrome, GI, musculoskeletal, and even ophthalmic effects. So now sex hormones. So this chapter covers, or this section covers, um, estrogens, progesterone, um, HRT. So let's go through it bit by bit. So estrogens. Now you can get synthetic and you can get natural estrogens. And there's many different examples of both. Something called tibolone is actually quite unique in that it has estrogenic, prostogenic and, and, and weak androgenic activity. It's like a three in one. And for women with a uterus who are undergoing long term estrogen therapy, it's recommended that they're also taking taking a progesterone as well. Now, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, that's usually for females who are going through menopause and particularly for women who have undergone early menopause. So if they're less than 45 years old and they're at risk of, for example, osteoporosis. Now, taking HRT does come with its risks. Um, you're at an increased risk of developing a stroke, of venous thromboembolism, of um, endometrial ovarian and breast cancer and coronary heart disease. Now that's not to say if you're going to take a heart HRT that you will, a patient will develop these, but it's just making the patient aware that, that taking HRT does come also with its risks. And a female is actually considered fe um, fertile for two years after having their last period, if they're under 50 years old, and sorry, yeah, if they're under 50 years old, and for one year if they're over 50 years old. Now, taking a HRT and progesterone can slightly reduce the risk of, take, of getting endometrial cancer. In terms of, um, you can get combination products. So you can get a conjugated estrogen with a progesterone. You can get um, estradiol with progesterone. You can get estradiol on its own. And there's many different brand names for the same medication. So it's good to be aware of that. In terms of progesterones, so again, you can get progesterone and its analogues. You can also get testosterone analogues. And there's, you can also get progesterone receptor modulators, for example, Ulipristal. And Ulipristal is one of those medications that can be used as an emergency contraceptive, but you need to know in which situations you would take Ulipristal over, for example, Levangesterol. So it's usually down to how many hours have passed since they've had um, their sexual encounter. Um, other uses for progesterones are, for example, in contraceptives, in mild to moderate endometriosis, or even in desmenorrhea. And general side effects are menstrual disturbances, weight changes, nausea, and even dizziness. So moving on to um, male sex hormones and antagonists. So androgens, they cause masculinization, and they're used in replacement therapy in castrated adults and in those who are hypogonadal. Testosterone can be used in postmenopausal women as an adjunct to HRT. Um, side effects tend to be an increased risk of prostate cancer, um, headache, GI bleeding, and nausea and vomiting. You can also get anti-androgens, for example, I'm not going to like saying this one, ciproterone, ciproterone, ciproterone. And that can be indicated in hypersexuality or sexual deviation in men or in acne in women. So two very different indications. Um, and you also get your 5-alpha reductase inhibitors. 
for example, duasteride, finasteride. And these finasteride in particular can be used in patients who have benign prostatic hyperplasia. And they inhibit testosterone metabolism. So this then helps with improving urinary flow and decreasing the prostate size. Now, finasteride, um, with women who are of, a ch of childbearing age shouldn't actually handle broken or um, crushed tablets of finasteride. And finasteride can also be used actually in men with male pattern baldness, but this is not prescribable on the NHS. So moving on to hypothalamic and pituitary hormones. So for example, we have gonadotrophin, and that can be used in um, infertility in females. We also have growth hormones, which can be used in children with Prader-Willi syndrome or Turner syndrome, or it can be used in adults, these growth hormones, for example, somatrophin, but that can only be used if three criteria are met. If they have a severe growth hormone deficiency, if it's really impairing the quality of life, and if they've been previously treated for another um, pituitary hormone deficiency. So only if all three are met, criteria are met, then they can be um, accepted for tr um, treatment with somatrophin. And then we have posterior pituitary hormones and antagonists, for example, vasopressin and desmopressin. Desmopressin is um, typically used for children who have quite a bad case of bedwetting. And that's because they have, they're quite potent and they have a long duration of action. So now let's talk about drugs that affect bone metabolism. So osteoporosis, there's many risk factors for osteoporosis, which include being a smoker, having a family history of it, or as we mentioned before, being on long-term steroids. Now, a person that has osteoporosis will need to have an adequate intake of calcium and vitamin D. And they may also be on bisphosphonates, but that's why typically you'll probably see prescriptions for a bisphosphonate and say ADCAL D3. So the two are usually given in conjunction with each other. Now, bisphosphonates are examples are alindronic acid and risodronate. And whilst they're very effective in postmenopausal osteoporosis, there is, it's very rare, but there is a risk of developing osteonecrosis in the external auditory canal in patients who have been taking bisphosphonates for more than two years. And whilst it is very rare, it is an important counselling point to tell your patients that this could potentially happen, in which case they need to report any ear related infection, pain or discharge. So the way that bisphosphonates work is that they reduce the rate of bone, bone turnover. And as we mentioned before, they can cause osteonecrosis of the external ear canal, external auditory canal. Um, they can also cause osteonecrosis of the jaw as well. So a patient needs to have good oral hygiene. Um, so our examples are alindronic acid and risodronate. So with risodronate, a person needs to take it 30 minutes before food and they need to avoid any calcium containing products, for example, milk. With alindronic acid, again, they need to take it 30 minutes before food. And once they've taken it, they need to remain upright for 30 minutes, um, either sitting upright or standing. Um, but it's so important that they do because one of the main side effects of alindronic acid is esophageal irritation. So if they develop any heartburn or any dysphagia, it's important that they stop taking the medication and they seek medical, um, medical attention straight away. And with something like alindronic acid, 70 milligrams, it's only taken once a week and it should be taken at the same time on the same day every week. So, for example, if Sunday is their day to take it, then Sunday, every Sunday at the same time, they need to be taking it. So other endocrine drugs are, for example, bromocryptine and dopaminergic drugs. The main side effect with these, though, is that um, they can cause sudden onset of sleep. So a patient needs to be cautioned when driving. So that was chapter six in a nutshell. Yes, it is a very content heavy chapter, but as I mentioned with the diabetes side of things and even with the thyroid medication, hopefully you do dispense those medicines um, quite frequently. So you're quite, um, you're quite familiar with them. And as I mentioned, when you're familiar with something, it tends to make it a little bit more easier understanding it. 
So hopefully you found this video useful. Um, if you did, please give it a like, please subscribe, um, please share, and also visit our Facebook page. So um, until next time, where we'll be going on to chapter seven, um, good luck with your revision and happy revisings.